right. Thank you very much. Uh, my second presentation will deal with the heat store project and within the heat store project, we are trying to implement a mine thermal energy storage at our site in Bochum, which I mentioned earlier today. And within the mine, uh, within the heat store project, uh, we have six demo sites and eight case studies. Uh, we have 24 partners from nine countries. Um, the overall project volume is uh, approximately 16 million euros and we received 50% funding. And just recently due to the COVID uh, situation, we um, received a project extension till November uh, of this year. And within this project, we are dealing with all sorts of thermal energy storage systems um, in the Netherlands, Switzerland. Uh, we are looking into the utilization of aquifer thermal energy storage systems in France. We're trying to implement a borehole thermal energy system. We are looking at the mines for a, a thermal energy system. And in, De in Belgium, the colleagues are trying to, to utilize the district heating grid most efficiently so that we have um, a better ut uh, utilization of the, the storage energy within the, um, within the grids. So now I will just jump into the history of the small colliery that is below our premises in uh, Bochum. Um, this was a situation after the Second World War that some very small uh, coal mining operations popped up throughout the Ruhr area due to the coal shortage. Um, the, our small colliery was operating between um, 53 and 58 and only produced up to it was roughly 40,000 tons of coal, um, very small, tiny operation. Here you can see the wooden shaft construction um, and it was operated by a spinning mill. And the daily production was between uh, 40 and 50 tons, overall production 37,000 tons. Um, unfortunately, the expectations by the owner were not fulfilled. So after a few years, uh, the Coldery was closed down, but from the quality of the gro of the coal, they were also mining low volatile bituminous coal. So actually, that was not too bad. But um, yeah, the expectations were were not really fulfilled, and I think this was not a very economical uh, operation for the owner. Um, as I showed earlier, this is also a picture from the visitation mine Zeche um, Nachtigall Nightingale in Witten. And this is just should indicate the wooden supporting beams um, that we are also anticipating in our uh, mine at our side. Just keep in mind the wooden frame. Um, in some sort, you will also see this uh, later on in the presentation. So just bear this in mind. Um, here you can also see just a drawing um, of the situation that in some part of the mines where it's crossed off here, you have some backfill, which is indicated by all this loose sandstone, mudstone or claystone, and also some open areas of the mine, which are indicated by this um, yeah, open part of, of the uh, gallery. So please bear this in mind because within our project, we encountered some parts that were open and some parts that were backfilled. So this also has an effect on the uh, hydraulic uh, properties of your storage as well. Um, here you can see the vertical mine layout. Um, it's quite a shallow um, uh, small colliery up to 68 meters below ground. We have a very steep, almost 70 degrees uh, dipping of the coal seam. We have four different drifts and um, what we are trying to initialize is to utilize uh, drift number four um, as a storage system. And for this, we drill two wells into drift number four in two different locations, which is one was located in the um, backfilled area and one in the non-backfilled area. And also to utilize um, for injection purposes, uh, one well into drift number one, which is just below the wine water table of approximately uh, 22 meters. Um, for monitoring purposes, um, we also utilize our existing groundwater monitoring wells. This is just a top view of our institution. 
we have in Bochum. So we have here some administration buildings, um, also a large scale um, research laboratory. And here you can see our drill site. We have our own drilling equipment on site. Uh, we also did uh, previously some um, groundwater monitoring wells, which we can now utilize for monitoring with uh, loggers for temperature and pressure. We also locked um, the temperature inside the, the newly drilled wells with glass fiber cables. And with this, we could uh, build up uh, a vast um, monitoring system. And for us, most important are these uh, three monitoring wells because they're closest to uh, the mine layout which you can see here. So just right below our drilling pad, we have um, the mine layout, which we drilled into. So here you can see drift number four. You can see some crossed off areas. This is the backfilled area and the non-backfilled area. So we try to, we drilled here, um, the first well into the non-backfilled area, the second well in the backfilled area, and then also in drift number one in the backfilled area at the end of our drill pad here in this position. Um, for the system for, for storing renewable heat, we're going to utilize um, a CSP plant, co a collected uh, solar thermal power plant. Um, this will be delivered actually tomorrow and then installed at the beginning of April so that we can run further injection tests during the summer with renewable heat. Uh, this will have a capacity of 60 kilowatts and uh, for the first round we will install half of the system so we will be operative with uh, 30 kilowatts um, during the summer for injection tests um, this will be the future layout so far we have one building where we're going to implement the uh, solar thermal collectors but in the future we will also extend our buildings and then have the solar collectors on top of it and as a technical uh, as a technical drawing you can see here the connections to to the to the wells and then also the connections to the um, uh, CSP plant and also in, in a later stage we will have a conjunction with a high temperature heat pump to see if we can feed temperatures into a district heating grid so this is the long-term vision of our project as well um, here you can see some pictures from the drilling operation that was conducted between June and September of last year. Um, here you can see our drill rig. Um, uh, these are the, the PVC pipings we used as a casing, so very cheap material, uh, temperature resistant up to 60 degrees, um, diameter of 175 millimeters. And here you can see this was our first well. Um, here you can see that we installed um, a, yeah, a nylon uh, packing system so that during cementing, we just installed this packer. And then afterwards, uh, after the cement hardened up that we could cement um, the annulus um, up to the surface as well. And here we are running the PVC casing. And so far uh, we could see that from our geophysical measurements, we only had a deviation from the starting point um of 20 centimeters uh um, horizontally so it was almost a vertical well um we didn't use any rotable rotary steerable systems out of cost reasons because it's a shallow operation what we did was uh, we used drill collars um and also um two stabilizers to have a very rigid um, drill string and this proved to be very efficient um, from three wells. We successfully hit um, the mine in the three spots we anticipated. So three out of three were successful. So this is uh, very good news on this end. Um, here you can see the location of, of the wells we drilled into. I previously mentioned here you can see um, the lithologic uh, sequence. Um, we took samples every meter. And on the right hand side, you can see that we installed um, the PVC casing up to a depth of 56 meters. And in the lower part, we installed um, what is eight meters of, of a filter screen with a mesh size of three millimeters to have a hydraulic connection to the mine. And then we installed this packer I showed previously. And after this was hardened up, we uh, cemented the annulus 
to the to the surface. And um, yeah, this is the first well we drilled. And here you can see we also did some downhole camera runs. You can see some wooden construction from the the, the timber support system. So very nice picture. And also from the cuttings, we could see that uh, we we actually really drilled into this support system. Um, from the third well, here you can see the sequence of the cuttings. You can see some core samples at the beginning of, of the well, and then we're also hitting into the coal seam. And here you can also see there's some wooden debris from the timber support system. And from the downhole camera run, we could see that we actually drilled right through one of the wooden platforms. So here you can see, unfortunately, this picture is not so clear, but you could see um, yeah, just the, the wooden debris on two sides. So yeah, th this was right on target. And coming back to the to the backfill in this well, we could really see that there was some backfill inside the mine. We didn't really in, encounter like a large open void, which we could see in the other two wells, which were drilled into the fourth drift. But on the in the first uh, drift, we could really see that there was backfill and was not really um, like an open void as previously mentioned. Um, we also did some numerical modeling. Before we did um, a heat injection test in December 2020, here you can see that we're producing 11 degree water, heating it up on surface and injecting up to 60 degree warm water in the second well, all on, on the premises of drift number four. And here you can see the distribution of the heat plume. And for the first Heat injection test, we heated up uh, 1,234 cubic meters for um, almost nine days. And we injected this uh, hot water with average temperatures of 46 degrees. Um, I did two tests where I jacked up the temperature almost up to 60 degrees, but only for a very short time. Um, so we utilized um, roughly 5.8 cubic meters per hour for injection rate. And uh, as a thermal storage, we, we tried to inject 50 megawatt hours. And for this, we utilize uh, a mobile heating unit, which is more or less just an uh, oil uh, furnace. Um, we use up quite a lot of um, yeah, heating oil, but uh, we had to generate some, some results because we weren't sure if we were granted an extension of the project. So. I stepped on the gas and did this injection test, which was quite successful. And here we can see some first um, results from, from the logging data we received from the um, injection well. We can see there's a thermal ramp up while we're doing the injection here. On the first, after, after one day, I jacked up the temperature and then I let it back to 46 degrees. Uh, then we have, I shut off the, the injection um, procedure over the weekend, and then I let it run for a full week. And we can see there's a nice upward thermal trend. Um, and after we stopped um, the thermal injection, we see a sharp decline, uh, which more or less indicates that the volume is quite large and that we're more or less just poured some hot water on that large volume. Uh, we also uh, we also did a short withdrawal test, and what is interesting to see that after the withdrawal test, which was more or less done to see what is the injection rate uh, for the backfilled um, well and um, to see how much water we can infiltrate there, is that after we stop the pumping, the the temperature goes back up again, so that we can see some temperature effects. And also, if you look at where we started. We are still above the starting temperature. So this is a nice first result. And during uh, the summer, we will continue to run the injection tests and to see or to gain more information also on the efficiency of the storage system. Uh, we also did some uh, analysis of the mine water. And with this, we also did a freak C uh, modeling to see what happens to the mine water if we heat it up to six degrees? What happens uh, or what are the risks of, of scalings and precipitations? And for us, uh, most dominant, we could see if we have an interference uh, with oxy oxygen. Also, this was described yesterday in, in the projects that we have some issues with, um, with ochre. 
and uh, iron oxide um, on, on the pipings. And here we can see um, after we uh, took out the pump, we can see a very nice degradation of, of the iron oxides on the pipings here. So this is a very important takeaway message uh, for the permanent insulation that we have to avoid any um, uh, oxygen infiltration into the system as well. Uh, for the modeling, I, I saw some questions regarding this in the chat. So uh, briefly, um, this is done by our project partner, Delta H. Um, they're using the uh, Spring software, which is a groundwater flow uh, modeling software uh, focusing on thermal hydraulic models. And for simulating our mine uh, uh, thermal energy storage system, they um, used their regional scale model. They included also the site scale model, which uh, is, is the mine layout itself. And then they also included a, a local scale model, which includes the fracture model um, to see what is the effect of the injection and withdrawal of temperature um, on, on the system as well. And here we can see, I, I, I first thought of not showing those videos, but I think as the questions arouse, I want to try to, to just show you what we can do within this program. You can see the geological profile and, and model of the site, and then also um, the model of the mine and also the wells. And we could see that we are more or less in a very nice syncline bathtub situation for our mine. It's, it's an isolated mine, so it's perfect conditions for testing out this uh, thermal energy storage system. And also second video to see, just to show you the injection process where we withdrew um, the water during the injection from the first well, heated it up to 46 and 60 degrees and then injecting it into the second well. And we can see that there is a large heat plume. We don't have um, a thermal crossing of all the temperatures to, this, to the first well, which we could also see in, in the logs. So this is more or less confirmed. So um, yeah, this is just to show you what we can do within the thermal hydraulic modeling. Um, okay, and this should, I'm sorry. I'll just go to the next slide. So as a takeaway take away message, um, what is our intention for the future? We want to couple this mine thermal energy storage with a district heating grid. So we want to utilize the, the heat, um, the renewable heat from the CSP plant in the summer stored in our um, mine thermal energy storage. And then if the, the need is during the heating season to combine, let's say 50 or 60 degrees, feed it into a high temperature heat pump that can put it up to temperatures of 80 to 100 degrees, and then feed this into the district heating grid. And for the district heating grid, we're also in a very close connection because our site is here. And in 300 meters um, distance, we have a connection to the district heating grid as well. So we're now in discussion with the uh, grid operator on how we can include the high temperature heat pump and in the future, hopefully also the storage into their system as well. And with this, um, I just want to like to, to, to give you an outlook possibility uh, that there is a vast opportunity, not only in our state, North Rhine-Westphalia, but I think also throughout Europe, which we already saw in the previous presentation, that um, just alone in the Ruhr area, we have almost 200 abandoned coal mines, which are indicated here by yellow dots. And here you can just see that it's just a vast potential that we should tap into to try to reduce our CO2 emissions. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation with a nice um, simulation of a two-phase flow problem, which uh, I think most people uh, uh, encounter uh, quite often. Thank you very much.